Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3 and find verses 7 to 11 where we will focus our attention this morning as we begin a broader section of Hebrews that really goes through verse 19. Over the next several weeks we'll be considering this second major warning passage in the sermon to the Hebrews. The warning is a simple warning against the deadly and deceptive sin of unbelief. Unbelief. What is unbelief? It may present itself in many ways. The obvious way is the all-out rejection of Christ in his word, but it can be the same as someone who is apathetic towards Christ and his word. Unbelief, however, is not doubt. Doubt is a struggle that can truly only exist within the confines of faith. We're not talking about doubt. That's its own sermon. Doubt is when you need help to believe. You need your belief to have help to believe. We're not talking about doubt. We're talking about unbelief. This is a warning against the deadly and deceptive danger of unbelief. Since mankind was created, unbelief has been our ultimate enemy. God created Adam and Eve, crafted a garden to fit their needs, and gave them aspirations that would be fulfilled as they pursued God in that garden, eternally perfect. With God was their hope. But a simple temptation to disbelieve God in the face of an entire universe of evidence that God was who he said he was, that simple temptation overcame both Adam and Eve, sin entered the equation, the curse was levied against man, death became our punishment, and 6,000 years later, man still falls to unbelief. Unbelief is a deceptive foe. Many think they stand on neutral ground before God, and either they can choose to follow him or choose not to, and then they feel like they can choose also the consequences of their choice. Unbelief makes fools Of us all. Fools thinking we rule our own hearts. We chart the course of our own lives. We are in control. We rule the universe. All our sinning grows out of the soil of unbelief in the risen Christ, the loving Father, and the active present work of the Spirit who speaks to us today and says to us something that's eternally significant. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Friend, today you may hear hard words. Well, let me say, you, you will hear hard words. But know as strong as that warning that comes from our passage is, that strong is the grace and the mercy and the love of Christ that beckons you to come to him, a caring, gentle, merciful Savior who says to all of you, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, says our Savior. There is no greater burden than unbelief. You don't recognize it because you're used to it. Unbelief actually is not unbelief. It's belief in yourself. It's trusting you. You've chosen to believe in yourself, a frail, unable, intellectually and physically limited being in every way imaginable, and you can't bear that burden. And you know it. You can't pull that yoke. And you feel it. And Christ says, come to me. I will give you what you can bear. I will take from you what you can't. And friend, as you hear the warning against unbelief that we'll consider carefully, you should check your own heart to see if you believe. And if you don't believe, consider who you've chosen not to believe. You've chosen to reject the king of glory who decided that in his humility, he would extend salvation and life and forgiveness to you. That's who you reject when you choose not to believe, and you choose you. You say, 
But preacher, this is church. So we all believe. That's, that's why we're here. Really? I'm not talking to visitors today. If you're a visitor, I'm glad that you're here. I hope you're able to profit from this. But I'm talking to those of you who've heard the gospel over and over. You know the gospel. You've probably preached the gospel. You've taught the gospel to other people. You have a mind full of gospel glory, but you have a heart that's cold and dead and dull and decayed with the stubborn, deceptive, deadly sin of unbelief. This warning is for those with the gospel bouncing off the walls of their head but no Christ in their heart. Perhaps you've memorized the 66 books. You know the kings of Judah. You can recite Jesus' lineage. You're pre-trib, pre-mill. You know the seven dispensations. You're fully reformed in your soteriology, but Jesus is nowhere to be found in your soul. This warning is for you. This warning is for our youth, our young people who are coming to church because people older than them that happen to pay their bills make them. They've grown up in Christian homes with Christian parents, Christian values. They've worn Christian t-shirts. Some of them even wore Christian onesies. They listen to Christian music, but they haven't chosen to follow Christ. This warning is for parents who've done their best to love their kids and raise their kids around Christ and put Christ before their kids and make sure they had a a Christ-centered Sunday school curriculum and point their kiddos to Christ all the while knowing deep in their soul they don't even know the Christ that they're pointing their kids to. This warning is for the spouse who tags along to church because it's easier than staying home and hearing about why you're staying home. Christ isn't their king because they're married to the world and their sin. This warning is for the old man and the old woman who by God's grace have grown old around the word of God and sensible because of it. They know their Bible. They know theology. They know people. They can put the two together. And yet they don't know Christ. Too many Christians have chosen to be a Christian without knowing Christ. They put on religion but they put off denying self and dying to self and following Christ. They put Sunday on their schedule, but they never put Christ on the throne of their heart. They look like Christians, but they know why they're here. It's the fool, the rest of us. They come a couple of times a month so we don't have awkward conversations. They keep coming, fooling us. But they've been deceived by the deadly, deceptive sin of unbelief. Unbelief is the vine our fruits of sin and evil grow on. Unbelief is the belief of Satan's lies. Unbelief is deadly. Unbelief is deceptive. But the gospel is clear. Turn from your sins. Turn from yourself. Turn to Christ and follow only him. You see, unbelief is never a product of a difficulty to understand the gospel. The gospel can be understood by those with, with the most severe mental struggles and rejected by those with the most brilliant minds this world has ever known. Unbelief is never a product of not understanding. Any unbelief amongst us is the fruit of our pride and our willingness to tell God with our fist in his face, I'm right, leave me alone. My friend, have you heard the love of God and the gospel of this preacher to the Hebrews that he's been giving to these people that he cares for? Remember what our Savior has done. He took on flesh. He partook of humanity so that for what purpose? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, he took on flesh that through his death he might destroy the devil, might destroy the fear of death that held you in slavery, might deliver you. You've been delivered. Death has been destroyed. And you want yourself? This warning in Hebrews 3 is to those who know these truths. This warning is to those who, when they sleep talk, their spouse hears Scripture. But in their soul, they hold on to their sin and their autonomy, their glory, and they refuse the one who is speaking. 
If you're a regular here, the warning is for you. You've seen Christ work. You've seen and heard his word. Will you continue in unbelief? You say, my life is good. I know the Bible and I'm, you know, someday I'll get there with Jesus. I'm just kind of, you know, just not an emotional person. J.C. Ryle says this, no sin makes less noise, but so surely damns the soul as unbelief. I wonder, Christian, do you know Christ? I wonder, churchgoer, do you know Christ? I wonder, newcomer, do you know Christ? I wonder, pastor, do you know Christ? I wonder, parent, do you know Christ? I wonder, young person, do you know Christ? You're here, all of you. Why? Is it because you know Christ? If not, and heed the warning today and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand with me and consider what we must do to avoid the deadly and deceptive sin of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3, we'll read verses 7 to 11. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you this morning for your truth, for the clarity of your word, for the active reality of your spirit speaking to us. Help us to hear by your grace. Give us clarity on who we are. Help us, Father, we need it. So we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, may be seated. Remember, as we jump into this passage, this is a sermon from a pastor to his people. This sermon is to the Hebrews struggling Believers fighting to live by faith. They were feeling the despair of this life more than the promises that were theirs for the next. They were doubting God's provision. They were doubting their ability to hold fast to Christ to the end. The life of our Hebrews that we have grown to know in chapter 3, it was difficult, hard. Their lives were unfulfilling on earth, disappointing on earth. That was their life. And so the preacher says, look, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, hold fast to our confidence in Christ's work. Boast in what he promises will come to us in the future. And then the preacher, he uses Psalm 95, which has its own context. And he he grabs a psalm out of the Old Testament to warn the Hebrews of the peril of not holding fast to Christ. So, what do we do with this warning? Well, we learn from this warning how to avoid the deadly and deceptive sin of unbelief. We begin in verse 7. First, learn to listen to God's word. You must listen to God's word. If you're wondering if you're believing, then ask yourself, are you listening to God's word? If you find that you don't really listen to God's word, you just kind of evaluate it and maybe try to memorize it to impress your peers, but you don't pursue its effects on your soul you don't pursue the living God of the living word, then you should be warned about your unbelief. Notice verse 7. Therefore, perhaps you could say, or so then. Uh, the preacher's carrying this argument forward. He's, he's got something that he's not done with. He wants us to look at the effects of what he just said. What was that? Verse 6, there's a condition. The condition of verse 6. We are his house, meaning we're saved. We're the household of God. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. We are his if our hands are full of Christ. We're his if our soul is saturated with just Jesus. Therefore, or so then, verse 7, it's like adding to this condition. He's adding what? Well, he's adding the command that's coming in verse 8, which is what? Do not harden your hearts. We are his if we trust only in him and we don't harden our hearts. We're listening to him. Imagine I told you Jesus was the perfect prophet. 
I told you Jesus was the, the perfect priest, the coming king, the exalted son, the one who rules and, ru- ru- rules and reigns over all things, better than angels, better than Moses, better than the law that they mediated to Moses, has the best news anybody could ever have. If I told you that about Jesus, then what? Well, then you better hang on to him with all of your life. That's what the preacher is saying. Don't worry about your circumstances. Just focus on Christ. The preacher to the Hebrews is doing this. Who is Jesus? This is who he is. Therefore, this is what you do. Listen to him. Beginning at verse 7. Therefore, the Holy Spirit says. Notice, not as David said in Psalm 95. Instead, the Holy Spirit says in Hebrews 3, verse 7. You can flip to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7, I think. Chapter 4, verse 7, right there in the middle of that verse. Through David. The preacher of the Hebrews wasn't confused on who wrote Psalm 95. In fact, he tells us who wrote Psalm 95. It was David. But back to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, what do you see? Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, present tense, it's vividly, richly, profoundly, even now being said by the Spirit. The Spirit is saying this right now to you. Are you listening? What a great view of the Bible, a great view of inspiration. It's inspired, inerrant, infallible, powerful, sufficient, complete, full, all you need for life and godliness, not because of some anonymous preacher to the Hebrews, not because of David's words, but because the Holy Spirit is the one who is speaking when you're reading your Bible. The Spirit takes his word, he illuminates his truth and sticks it into your heart so you can understand it. The Holy Spirit is now bringing the benefit of God's grace and mercy and love to bear in power on your life. The Holy Spirit is now speaking the wisdom you need to live your life for Christ. It didn't come from Paul. It didn't come from John. It comes from Jesus, the superintendent of the Father, the work of the Spirit in your soul. The question is, if you want to avoid unbelief, are you listening to God's Word? The Bible, the words in your Old Testament, the words in your New Testament, are, they're the Holy Spirit saying. Are you listening? When you read your Bible, do you find God is communicating with you Now? When you read your Bible, you're not reading an ancient letter from Peter to the saints spread out through Galatia and Cappadocia. You're reading Revelation. You're not reading John's letter from exile to the seven churches spread on an ancient poster route. You're reading what the Spirit is saying now. You're reading the present act of speaking of God to his creation for all time. It's in its timeless perfection, its perfect application, and its faultless commentary on the eternal souls that have always existed in every single age. God speaks powerfully, clearly, perfectly, right now to you. Do you listen? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, the Holy Spirit says, my question for you, are you listening? What does he say? Well, he says, hear God's word. Second, you see, today. That's what I want you to notice. Today. Hear God's word today. Friend, you know the only day you were promised was yesterday. The only meal you were promised, I've seen some of you eat those free donuts in Grace Life. That was a meal. The only breath you were promised was the one you just exhaled. Life is short. Eternity is forever. Notice, second, you must hear God's word today. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Come to Christ, know his grace and his mercy. Feel his forgiveness and feel his love today. Today is emphasizing that this very moment, not, not yesterday, not tomorrow, at this very present time right now, listen to him. Don't wait. God wrote his word for you for this very moment in your life. Listen to him. Hear him today. Hear him now. Don't wait. The deadly and deceptive danger of unbelief is believing the lie that tomorrow will be just fine. Hear him now. Unbelief says, I'll keep learning and someday I'll make it right with God. Today. Unbelief is belief in the lie of tomorrow. You, friend, have now, and that's all you've been promised. Believe 
listen to God. The point of our preacher to the Hebrews is that if one knows the truth about Jesus and knows the truth about his gospel, then they shouldn't be like the Israelites of old who heard the truth of God, saw the work of God, and chose not to follow God. That's his point. There were Israelites upon Israelites who knew God's truth and saw his miracles and yet failed to surrender to his call to follow him. They hardened their heart. Perhaps our Old Testament anemia puts us at a disadvantage. If you want, you can turn to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. If you were here last week, you heard us talk about Numbers chapter 12. We saw Aaron and Miriam and their ultimate sibling rivalry wanting some of Moses' glory. Their envy boiled over. Instead of glory, they got a warning from God. Then in Moses, uh, then in Numbers chapter 13, there's the Hebrew people with their law miraculously given to them by the angels from God, established as a people, ripped from the bondage of slavery in Egypt and ready to inherit the choicest land along the entire fertile crescent in the ancient world that we'd ever known called Canaan. This land of Canaan was the land of promise that was promised to Abraham their ancestor. And here are the Hebrews, generations and centuries after Abraham, ready to inherit the promised land from Yahweh. Numbers chapter 13 tells the story of the spies sent to scope out the land. What they find is amazing and terrifying. The land is perfect in every way. The inhabitants, though, are scary. They're too much for the apparently ill-equipped and under-militarized Hebrews. So 10 spies report the terror of what would befall Israel or the Hebrews if they pursued this conquered or this promised land that God said they could conquer. Their report is summarized, the end of chapter 13. You can see it in verse 33. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. They said, we walk in there, we're going to get squished. Not doing it. Nope. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said God will deliver the land into our hands. Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, tells you of the mob rule in the ancient Hebrews. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would that we died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? This, friend, is the context of Hebrews chapter 3. This is the story that it's hearkening back to. This is the story that David was psalming about. God has done everything to deliver, preserve, miraculously save, supernaturally provide for the Hebrews. And they respond in what? Unbelief. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt or that we had died in this wilderness. Unbelief is deceptive and deadly. These Hebrews thought they were saving their skin by not invading Canaan. Little did they know they were sealing their destruction. Hear God's voice today. Joshua and Caleb, they say God will give us his promises. Ten spies say, not going to do it. The ancient Hebrews chose not to hear God's word today, thinking that maybe someday it would be easier. Do you notice in that first phrase, if you're back in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, today, if you hear his voice, do you feel the consequence of that? There's an option there. There's a, there's a condition there. Hear his voice and find freedom, deliverance, salvation. Don't listen. Receive judgment and wrath. It's not only foolish, but dangerous for you to wait until tomorrow to hear God's voice because you don't have tomorrow, friend. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Come now, come now, God says. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be come like wool. If you are willing, come now. If you're willing, God says, let me do for you what you can't. You say, I'll wait till tomorrow. Come now if you're willing. Hebrews 3, 7, today if you hear his voice. What a terrible word, if is. It means that some of you are saying, 
not me. Some of you have postponed coming to Christ. You've put it off. And that day in the far distant future has never come any closer. It's always then, never now. Perhaps a voice from long ago, a Puritan in the 1600s named Thomas Cole writes this to us today. It will be as difficult, nay, more difficult to come to Christ tomorrow than it is today. Therefore, today hear his voice and harden not your heart. Break the ice now and by faith venture upon your present duty wherever it lies. Do what you're called now to do. You will never know how easy the yoke of Christ is till it is bound about your necks nor how light his burden is until you've taken it up. While you judge of holiness at a distance... As a thing with, without you and contrary to you, you will never like it. Come a little nearer to it. Do but take it in. Actually engage it and you will find religion carries meat in its mouth. It is of a reviving, nourishing, strengthening nature. It, it brings that along with it that enables the soul to cheerfully to go through with it. If I could summarize Cole, it's this. Knowing Christ at a distance is not knowing Christ. Imagine it like this. You have a friend of your family. They're, they're going to go see the Grand Canyon. They're going to take a week off, and they're going to go to see the Grand Canyon. And so they're gone for a week, and they come back, and you say, how was the Grand Canyon? I say, man, it was, well, it was a great drive. Oh, what was the Grand Canyon like? You know, we took 54 down through that area, Guyman, Goodwell, Godforsaken Place in Oklahoma, and then down through, like, Dalhart, Texas, Tucum Carry, and hopped on 40. Oh, well, how was the Grand Canyon? Man, it was a great drive. We, we ended up staying at Flagstaff. Well, how was the Grand Canyon? We had a great hotel, Embassy Suites. How was the Grand Canyon? It was a great place, free bacon for breakfast. Wow, it's good stuff. How, how was the Grand Canyon? And then we came back, and it was a great trip. How was the Grand Canyon? Well, we, you know, we went to see it. Well, did you see it? Well, we went to see it. That's some of you with Jesus. Do all this stuff. You don't go to Jesus. Go to him. Listen to him. Today, friends, set aside what's holding you back from him. And find in him what you long for today, not tomorrow. Will you listen? Israel did not. She would not listen. Can you imagine two old Hebrew men standing at a crossroads of tents in the ancient wilderness? No rain for months in the wilderness. Not a fertile forest in the desert. No food for a family, let alone this massive clan about to be a nation somewhere around a million people. Livestock, how'd they get food? Google it, nobody knows springs of water came up out of the wilderness and perhaps that caused desert plants to bloom. Maybe they ate manna in the tents with the people. We don't know how their livestock ate, but we do know it had to be supernatural. All these people, they got water out of the ground, Psalm 78, 16. Food fell from the sky. Everything in the wilderness pointed to God's supernatural care and provision and protection of his people, his faithfulness, not theirs. He provided food where there was none. He provided water where there wasn't. His expectation was very simple. I'll do all this for you. You worship me alone. That was it. God provided his miraculous love, power, provision, all of it. And here's these two old Hebrew men chewing the fat as old men do, shooting the breeze. And they see Moses walking towards the tent of meeting. Exodus chapter 33, verse 9 tells us when Moses went to the tent of meeting, that pillar of cloud would descend in front of the tent or the tabernacle. It was like, it's like God was guarding the tent to make sure nobody messed. And there he is in there, and these old Hebrew men, they grew up as slaves in Egypt. Their hands had the scars of work, and their back had the scars of the whip. They they saw the deliverance of God out of the power and the stronghold of evil in Egypt. And they were there at the Red Sea. They saw the water come out of the rock. They ate the food from heaven. They saw the, the plagues and the panoply of God's power and his might. And here they are, constant evidence before their eyes, at their hands, in their bellies of God's power, love, faithfulness. And these two old men, what did, what did they have? They had hard hearts, 
were so hard, they could see, they could taste, they could hear, they could smell the wonder of God's work and not believe that God was working. The Holy Spirit is saying today, if you hear his voice, today. I wonder, will you hear it? If there was something more God could say to you, I would love to know. What do you think God has left out? The Hebrews and the Israelites of old, whether in Moses' time or David's time, they all, they all looked forward to what God would do to finally settle all this disunity between creation and creator, wondering when he would act. But you have the advantage. You look back. You don't have manna. You have the bread of life. You don't have a pillar of cloud. You look back, you see a dark sky on a noonday. We're there on Calvary. All the future promises of a covering, of a coming, suffering servant, Savior, King come to fruition in perfection where this long-awaited Messiah brings peace between man and God where he dies for his people as their sacrifice there with outstretched arms his chin down on his chest hands and feet driven through with a nail side pierced with a spear our sacrifice forever satisfied the wrath of God because he took the wrath of God and it killed him today if you hear his voice, if. God has spoken in these last days by his son. Have you heard it? If you hear his voice, but friend, what a lovely word if is, because if tells us that when we listen and don't harden our hearts, we will be saved. We will have that rest that we so desperately need. But if you turn to Christ, if you look on him whom you've pierced, then his death is yours. His life is yours. His righteousness becomes yours. Your failures disappear under the wrath of God that he suffered under so that you could be made a son or a daughter. If you hear, you can be with him forever. Hear God's word today. In verse 8, be warned. Third, listen to God. Don't harden your heart. Be careful with your heart, friend. Don't put off until tomorrow what God tells you you must do today. Our necessity is to hear the Lord speaking, but the temptation is to harden our hearts and not deal with it today because we're busy. We got things like lunch. Many of you have been hearing preaching, listening to sermons, reading your Bible, seeing God at work in your life, seeing God at work in the lives of other people, and yet you haven't surrendered to Christ. There's something more important than your eternal soul. You know he's Lord, but you live as if he's sharing his glory with you. You hear him say, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, but you're like, ah, that'll be great on Tuesday. You wait. And over time, these wounds of your heart that are wounded by hearing of your sin and wounded as you're called by Christ to repentance and you reject it, you build scar tissue on your heart instead of this sound doctrine producing a soft heart, it produces sores and scabs and scar tissue and a rough, ugly heart toward the voice of God that cannot hear him. But friend, if it's even a whisper today, then you can hear what you need to hear. Because when you come to him and you turn from yourself and you trust in him, what do you have all that he has to offer? If you'll hear him today. Sometimes grown-ups can be like kids playing at dinner time. You know, kids playing at dinner time. You're like, kids, time to set the table for dinner. They're like, did you hear that? Oh, I didn't hear that. Did you hear somebody say set the table for dinner? Oh, I didn't hear somebody set the table for dinner. I think they said, let's keep playing. Great. That's like adults. When God is calling to you saying, come to me. What? Live my life how I want? Sounds good. I got it. Friend, to not hear God Today is deadly. 
just a reminder, this is a warning for the church. This is for those who claimed Christ. This warning was for those who said, sign me up, I'm in the Lord's army. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take care who? Family, brothers. Verse 13, exhort one another. Chapter 4, verse 11. Let us strive to enter that rest. This is a warning to believers to persevere and a call to the unbelievers amongst us to repent and trust only in Christ. And this text, like all the warning passages in Hebrews, it assaults any man-centered confidence that you put in your theology. What do I mean by that? Simply, theology does not save you. Jesus does. We eat, sleep, live, breathe, drink, and die on the hill of God's sovereignty at Grace Bible Church. Praise the Lord. God's sovereignty in all things, especially salvation and our perseverance. Why? Because we believe God's word says what it means and means what it says. We're told Romans chapter 8, verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justifies. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. We believe that that is true. Those works by God are accomplished in truth, not theory or intention. But we also believe that the saints are called to persevere. Your theology of eternal security will not save you. Jesus saves you. And the message to the Hebrews is unapologetic in the reality that those who are saved hold fast to the one who saves them. And how do they hold so fast to him? Because he's holding on to them. We trust and know that perseverance is enabled by God. His power through faith, we're able to hold on to him, but we're responsible for this. And yet he's the one enabling our responsibility to be completed by us. Praise God, you're on the hook, friend. Don't theologize yourself off the hook. You can't get yourself in the boat with good theology. You persevere. You hang on in this life. You hold fast to Christ. You fight the good fight. Don't give up. How do you don't give up? You understand. Don't harden your heart. Listen. Listen to God. Don't harden your heart if you want to avoid the deadly and deceptive sin of unbelief. Fourth, don't test God. Verses 8 and 9. Don't test God. If we pick it up in the middle of verse 8, the hardening of the hearts is the context. It was in the rebellion and the testing in the wilderness where the ancient Hebrews tested Yahweh when they saw his work and rejected him. The language here is hearkening back to Numbers 13 and 14. This rebellious generation of Hebrews takes the center stage in the book of Numbers from murmuring about food to missing meat to too much quail, et cetera, et cetera. Then Miriam and Aaron challenging Moses. The early days of the Hebrews out in the, the wilderness out of Egypt were hard. People were not familiar with following God. The people didn't like Moses' leadership, and rebellion was their go-to coping mechanism. And the psalmist in Psalm 95, he points to that ancient generation, and he uses it to illustrate his present generation, admonishing them to not harden their hearts in that day. The preacher to the Hebrews, he does the same thing. So David, he's writing somewhere around 1000 B.C., looking back to somewhere around 1400 B.C. The preacher to the Hebrews is preaching in the 6th decade A.D., and then here we are in 21st century A.D. And what do we all need? The exact same thing. Why? Because we all have the exact same heart outside of Christ. We need reminded to listen to God because if you're not listening to God, what are you doing? You're testing him. And friend, God will never fail. He will fulfill his promises. And your promise when you test God is not one that you want him to fulfill. The wilderness generation provoked the Lord through their unbelief and their disobedience repeatedly and refused to enter the land of Canaan when they were commanded to. God says, here's what's best for you. Go ahead, take it. It's yours. They said, nah. The preacher says to the weary Hebrews of his generation a few decades after Christ's death, be careful. Jesus says your hope is near. He doesn't say it's here. You have a heavenly calling. Chapter 3, verse 1. Why is that so important? Because you're on earth. Your heavenly calling is heavenly. If all the promises of God were fulfilled here, God would be a liar. But they're not fulfilled here. You have a heavenly calling. The promised land 
is coming. The rest you long for is just over the horizon, but what's the name of the horizon? Death. Don't give up. Don't let go. Don't put God to the test. Instead of trusting God, the Hebrews in the wilderness, they tested God. Friend, if God loves you, there will be areas of your life where he is testing you. And you don't need a certain percentage point to pass the tests that God gives you. It's really a pass-fail test, and there's only one question. Every test from God has one question. Will you listen to God? Because all the other things come into place when you listen to God. In your struggle, will you listen to God? In your wilderness, will you listen to God? In your unfulfillment, will you listen to God? In your sin, will you listen to God? What does it mean to listen to God? It means you keep your heart tender and sensitive to the word of God. It means to follow Christ where he leads. It means to trust your heavenly father when you're not sure what he's doing. It means to listen to God, not yourself. Will you follow Christ? Will you trust your heavenly father? Despite the circumstances that you're in, don't test God, friend. It has never worked. God will never be found insufficient. God will never be found a failure or lacking or unable. God will never fail to fulfill his promise. And his promise, if you test him, is wrath. Watching God work but not responding in faith is testing God. Doubting God's love, doubting God's power, doubting God's sufficiency, doubting God's plan, all of these things, if they characterize your life, then friend, listen to the warning of the preacher to the Hebrews and the spirit to you. Are you in Christ? Do you know Christ? Or are you in church? Watching TV does not make me an actor. Watching church doesn't make you a Christian. Do you know Christ? This is what the generation of Israelites did when they, they rejected the promised land. They, they, they knew that God would provide, but they're like, eh, uh, that looks tough. So they didn't believe God. They, they said, God doesn't love us if he's giving us a land inhabited by giants. God doesn't have the power to subdue these people like he crushed Egypt. God isn't sufficient enough for us to have what we need to conquer Canaan. God's plan isn't good enough. Do you need me to draw the lines to those responses in your life? Do you ever doubt God's power, even though you say he delivered you from darkness into light? Do you ever doubt God's plan, even though you can't even remember your Gmail password? And you want to take control of your life. Are you like the Israelites wandering the wilderness, watching God's work for decades and somehow mistaking the amazing grace of God in his provision for his people, mistaking that as some sort of a divine mistake? See, the Israelites heard God, saw God work, but because of the hardness of their hearts and their unbelief that caused them to believe the lies of Satan that he's been preaching since the garden. Did God really deliver you fully out of Egypt? I mean, he brought you out here to die. Did God really deliver you from sin? You just can't shake it, can you? Did God really provide what you needed with manna? Did God really provide what you need through your work? Did God really intend to bless you in Canaan? Does God really intend to bless you as you pursue him, even in the difficulty of your life now? The Israelites didn't believe God. They tested God. Their testing provoked God. We often fail to believe that God is who he says he is, and our testing God provokes him. Don't provoke God with your unbelief. Verse 10, don't provoke God, because when you provoke God, he will eventually judge you. Verse 10, therefore, what does that mean? Well, they all doubted God. For 40 years, they doubted God. Verse 9, therefore, the consequences were real and eternal in verse 10. They looked at God's resume and they said, eh, not enough. Liberation from Egypt, we could have done that. Food falling from heaven, we could have figured it out. Water popping up out of the ground, we'll get it figured out. Somehow, God isn't enough, we think, but we are. That's the constant refrain of unbelief. And that's what happened with Israel. 
either his wisdom wasn't enough or his provision wasn't sufficient or his blessing was lacking. Somehow, God's salvation wasn't enough for the wandering generation. So God said, end of verse 10, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. They always go astray. You know what that is? That's in the present, just like the Spirit is saying is in the present. It's always happening. God is always saying, Israel's always going astray. Friends, if you want to avoid an unbelieving heart, don't allow yourself to stray from what God says is best. The Israelites didn't listen to God. The Israelites tested God. They provoked God, and God delivered on his promise, which was what? Wrath. Finally, to avoid unbelief, understand there are two options, wrath or rest. Rest becomes a major theme throughout the rest of the book of Hebrews. Verse 11, as I soar in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Rest what we want. Wrath, what we get for unbelief. Friend, have you considered what your dogged, willful, resentful unbelief does to God? Are you so proud that you think it's just a decision for you? When God has said, I love the world so much, I'll send my son to die for these people, and you're like, I'm good. Maybe you've got us all fooled. Do you know that doesn't matter? You cannot fool God. There will be a judgment day and you will be there. I won't be at yours. You won't be at mine. You don't need to fool me. And you cannot fool God. Imagine there's the Hebrews on the verge of the promised land. Egyptians, the plagues, the waters coming out of rocks, all that stuff in the background crossing through the Red Sea, the promised land before. One more act of faith, just one more, and the promised land was hers. She was right there. She was so close. She could, she could smell the olive oil. She could see the bees making honey. She could hear the cows being milked. It was coming. It was so close, right there, just over this hill of faith. One more step for this generation to go from slaves to ruling the known world in the promised land. They didn't listen to God. They didn't feel his urgency. He said today, they hardened their hearts toward his word. He said today, they tested him. They provoked him and they earned his wrath. Friend, what about you? Have you been putting off really knowing Christ? This is why unbelief is the deadliest of sins because it provokes God. It brings out his wrath. Unbelief causes God to choose not rest for you, but wrath for you, because you reject his son, the one who took your wrath. You said, no, I got it. I can do it. No, you can't, friend. Have you been born from above? You need to hear this today. Examine yourself and see if you are in the faith. Do you know Christ? Are you on the narrow way because you went through the narrow path? Or are you living willy-nilly however you want in this life, hoping for the best, friend? The best is right here if that's you. Has the old passed away and new things come? Does the Spirit seal your heart? Does your heart cry out to your Father knowing that He's your Father? Or are you just here? Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Jesus climbed the hill of Calvary to bear your sin, to take your wrath so that you could have God's eternal, beautiful rest. His effort was one of love. His every motive was full of mercy. His passion was for you to live with him forever. Today, if you hear his voice, turn from yourself, run from your sin, cast your whole soul on Christ, and what will you see? That he will take you to himself. Find forgiveness Feel love, no true rest, rest, grace for today, glory for forever, only in Christ, will always be yours today if you hear his voice. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for Reminders to examine our own hearts. I pray for those who believe that they would find your work sufficient, full, beautiful, complete, and long for more. And those who do not yet believe that they would see your call to them 
It's to turn from their selves, to trust in their Savior, to believe only in Him. That by Your grace, through faith in Your Son, we can have life forever with You. There's no other way. Help us to surrender to these realities, to submit to Your truth, to worship You with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.